But first, I'd like to say hello to everyone and, and welcome them to the first of our educational webinars for this year. Uh, this is going to be part of a whole series that we'll be doing, just like we had done last year. Some of the topics we'll be covering in future webinars are going to include things like cybersecurity and identity theft protection, talk about social security, about Medicare, education planning, and more. Uh, but I'm excited to be kicking it off this year with estate planning and end-of-life planning, as this can be one of the most difficult areas to tackle, uh, but creating and maintaining uh, a plan for the end of your life and communicating that uh, with your, your heirs and your family uh, will be one of the greatest gifts you'll be able to give them. Uh, we, we've seen clients who have successfully done this, uh, create and maintain a plan, and we've seen those who have not and I can just tell you, it makes a, a major difference for those that uh, are left behind. So uh, I'm thrilled to introduce our two presenters today. We're gonna be starting with Alyssa Graham Garrigan, who is a partner at Ansel and Anderson. And Alyssa graduated magna cum laude from Boston University, and then summa cum laude from Suffolk, Suffolk University Law School, and then received her master's degree in taxation from Boston University of Law. If that's not enough education commitment for you, Alyssa is a graduate of the American College of Trust and Estate Council's 2022 New England Fellows Institute. Along with all that, Alyssa is a member of the New Hampshire Bar Association and the American Bar Association. She's also a member of the New Hampshire Estate Planning Council and serves on their executive committee. And she has been named a rising star by super lawyers for several years in a row. And our firm has been working with her and her firm for over a decade. We've trusted them with many of our clients and our own family's estate plans uh, over all that time. So I'm excited to have uh, Alyssa present some basics on estate planning. Uh, after Alyssa presents, we'll have the opportunity to listen to Buddy Fanouf about arranging funerals and end of life planning um, and, and many of the questions that we do receive from clients uh, during our meetings. And so I'll introduce him in greater detail at that time. But for now, um, Alyssa, I'm gonna have you start. So I'm gonna share, have you share your screen here in one moment. Okay. Excellent. So you should be able to, at this point, share your screen. Perfect. I hope everybody can see that. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, I am going to be kind of running through some basic understanding of estate planning um, and some strategies. Obviously, um, we're going to talk for about half an hour about these documents. So there's a lot more in depth, and I am always happy to answer any questions. So if um, you have something, I'm sure James can share my contact information. Yes. Um, please feel free to reach out to me if I can clarify anything that I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, my idea is that I'm going to cover advanced directives, um, wills, revocable trusts, and I'm going to try to touch on some aspects of irrevocable trusts as well. I would say that the first three are kind of your building blocks of your estate plan. And then an irrevocable trust typically is something that we would add on um, if appropriate once you have the other basics in place. Selfishly, for your own purposes, I think advanced directives are the most important documents to have in place. And so pretty much universally, everybody that comes through our door, we try to get them to leave with at least advanced directives. These are documents to allow somebody to make decisions for you if you are alive but incapacitated. Um, and without them, your um, family typically has to go through some kind of costly guardianship proceeding, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second. But it's they're really easy documents to get in place and they are really very critical to assisting um, your family and making sure that you're taken care of should you ever need to if you become incapacitated. So there are two types. 
their advanced directives for healthcare and durable general powers of attorney. Those are the financial ones. And just as they say, it sound like advanced directives for healthcare are to allow somebody to make your healthcare decisions for you if you are alive but incapacitated. Um, each state has their own version of these forms. So New Hampshire's is called the New Hampshire Advanced Directive for Healthcare. But for example, in Massachusetts, it's called the healthcare proxy. They're all essentially the same type of document that do um, two functions. Um, one is to appoint people to make decisions for you. And the second is to hopefully give your family some kind of direction regarding um, your wishes should you become incapacitated. In New Hampshire, the first part is exactly that. It's a power of attorney where you're going to appoint people to make decisions for you. A lot of people think this form is only end of life care, but for whatever reason, you could be incapacitated. You could be incapacitated for a day. Your agents need to make decisions to make you better. Um, and uh, this document allows them to do this. It also allows them to make end of life care choices. And the living will in New Hampshire is now a document that addresses whether you would grant your agents the authority to terminate life support. Um, so you kind of have two ch overarching choices, either regardless of the circumstances, they're never allowed to terminate life support, or um, if they think it's appropriate, they're allowed to terminate life support. The New Hampshire document changed um, about two years ago. So if you have an old form and it looks a little different than what I just described, it's still completely valid. Old forms are still valid, but the new form, um, the only questions are on the living will portion of this. If you have loved ones who are over the age of 18, they, you know, young adults um, don't necessarily need all the other documents that we have in place, but we do try to encourage our clients to get their kids even to come in once they turn 18 to sign these documents. And they don't need to come to an attorney to do that. We actually have the form available for download on our website. It only either takes a notary or two witnesses to sign these documents. And so um, it's really easy to execute and everybody should have one. Um, the other powers of attorney are financial powers of attorney. So this is somebody who would step in your shoes for financial matters if you are alive but incapacitated. Typically, a general power of attorney can do everything that you can do including access your bank and investment accounts, access your retirement accounts, make sure you, if you're over retirement age or taking your required minimum distributions, uh, pay your bills, talk to your medical. Um, if you have medical bills, make sure that those are getting paid, um, your mortgage, credit card bill, sell real estate if it's in your name alone, um, file tax returns, and really just, sorry, and really just, take care of all of your financial matters for you. If you have a trust, and I'll talk about that in a minute, this person would act in conjunction with your trustee um, if you become incapacitated, but um, it's generally stepping into your shoes. This is very different than a lot of people's familiarity with the power of attorney is like if they went to um, sell their house but couldn't attend a closing, they might have signed a power of attorney a limited power of attorney just for that interaction. This is much broader and really designed to cover all aspects of your financial life. So what happens if you don't have these and you become incapacitated? For healthcare decisions, at least in New Hampshire, we have what's called the surrogacy law that would um, allow somebody to make some healthcare decisions for you if you're alive but incapacitated. It is designed to allow somebody to make decisions without having to go through the full guardianship process. But there's an order of priority for who would make those decisions and not everybody wants that followed. The problem with the surrogacy law is there's some question about how far that the surrogate can take those healthcare decisions. It only lasts for a certain period of time. And if you have two people or more in the same order of priority and they don't agree, then there's no one designated to make your decisions. 
The other option is that you would have to get a guardianship um, over an incapacitated person. Um, and that is a court process. It involves going to court. The ward has to have an attorney. That's the person that's incapacitated. Typically, you as the person trying to get guardianship has an attorney. So right there, you're dealing with two attorneys going to court. It's costly, it's time consuming, and it's just not needed. So get those powers of attorney in place. That deals with all of the documents for if you are alive but incapacitated. I'm going to switch over to the documents you would need to organize your affairs at your death. So um, when you pass away, if you have no estate planning documents in place, there is a law in every state called an intestacy law that provides where your assets would pass. It is a statutory um, scheme that says, you know, and typically it depends on your family makeup. If you're married, a portion might go to your spouse. If you have children in New Hampshire, at least a portion goes to your spouse and a portion goes to your children. Um, if you're not married, but you have children, it would go to your children. If you don't have children, it would go up your family tree and out until they find living relatives. That's what happens to those assets that are just in your name alone if you don't have a will. Um, other of your assets may pass outside of probate, regardless of the documents you have in place. Those are things that would have beneficiary designations, things like life insurance and retirement accounts would pass to the beneficiaries. What a will does is direct the manner in which you want your property to pass at the time of your death through a court process called probate. So a will in and of itself does not avoid probate. It is just direction to the court of who you want to, to receive your assets. So they would follow your will instead of following the intestacy law. Particularly important for people thinking that all of their assets would pass to their spouse, as I mentioned in New Hampshire, that's actually not the default. So it, even if you're married, so you may think everything just passes to your spouse, but that might not be the case. So you still might need a will, um, even if you, you know, want everything to pass to your spouse and then to your children if you have children. The other advantage of a will is you get to pick who the executor is. The executor is the person who would direct the probate process. Um, with the intestacy law, there's an order of priority, but with a will, you get to say who you want to be your executor. Just like with the intestacy law, even if you have a will in place, certain assets can avoid probate um, by beneficiary designation. And the other important thing to remember is that a beneficiary designation is always gonna trump what your will says. So if you create a new will thinking it's gonna take care of everything, um, we often have this issue come up with people that may be recently divorced. They think, oh, I'll just update my will. I don't need to update my beneficiary designations. That is not the case. Um, beneficiary designations trump the will. So you do need to, when you wanna change who the beneficiaries are, also change your beneficiary designations on things like retirement accounts and life insurance to match what you want to have happen. Now they can go to different people. You could say, I want all my assets under my will to pass to my sister, Sally, but I'm going to leave my um, retirement account or my life insurance to my brother, John. Um, that's fine. As long as that's what you want. But those beneficiaries are going to pass to the beneficiaries designated and your will, anything that goes through probate is going to pass to the people designated in the probate document. Um, the final thing a will does that no other document can do is nominate a guardian for minor children. So um, if you have minor children, this is going to be where you pick who their guardians would be. And for this purpose, a guardian is the person who would make decisions for them um, if both parents passed away. So things like where they would live, the types of education they would receive, the type of medical care they would receive, that would be the guardian's job and the will is where you would nominate that person. 
um, the final reminder that wills don't avoid probate, which is a question that we get quite often. I have a will, I won't go through probate. That's just not the case. It's just a direction for probate. So you want to avoid probate of all of your assets. What's your option? You're talking about a revocable trust typically. Now that's not always the case. Some people have assets that can be completely left by beneficiary designation, but assets that can't include a beneficiary, um, for example, are real estate. So if you have real estate um, between a husband and wife, you can own that jointly, but generally there's, there's no way to add a beneficiary to that. So um, it would pass through probate when the death of the survivor of the spouse, spouses, excuse me. So people look to revocable trusts. Revocable trusts also sometimes referred to as living trusts, intervivos trusts, all of those terms mean the same thing. Um, in our practice, we call them revocable trusts. What is a revocable trust? It is a container to hold your assets. Um, during your lifetime, you retain complete control over this trust. Assets can move freely in and out of it. You have unrestricted use of these assets. And um, if you become incapacitated, it allows for management of those assets for your benefit. For married couples, it is also possible to do one trust for a husband and wife or spouses. Um, and in that instance, both um, spouses are in control of the assets. It kind of works like a joint account. Um, either one can control assets. If something happens to one spouse, the surviving spouse retains complete control over all of those assets. You can also have separate trusts. So each spouse has a separate trust. Um, and that's just a choice that you would make at the time for what makes sense for your family situation. But um, it is possible to do a joint trust. What a trust is not, what this type of trust is not, is an asset protection vehicle. Because these assets are freely available to the person creating them, they do not provide any kind of asset protection. So this is not a Medicaid planning tool. And I'll talk about that at the end, but I just wanted to make it clear. So why do people create revocable trusts? They create them for tax planning. However, the current state tax exemption amount is $12,900,000. And um, that's per person. So if you have spouses, each person gets those, it, that exemption amount. So obviously for most people, tax planning is not a motivating factor anymore. Um, although certainly we deal with clients still where that's an issue and trust can be utilized to um, maximize the amount that you can pass tax-free. Most people today, however, are creating trusts to one, avoid probate. So while probate is just a court process, some people want that, um, their family not to have to deal with that. And then the other reason is for management of assets after death. So I'm gonna talk about management of assets. Why would you want to manage assets after somebody passes away? And there's a whole host of reasons people do this. Anytime you don't want somebody to receive a lump sum and you wanna hold it for their benefit, you are talking about holding it in trust for them. It can be for um, minors. So this is the classic example. Um, and you know, when you have minor children, you don't want them and they can't even really accept assets. So if you pass away and both parents pass away, you'd want those assets managed for their benefit. So for example, I have two little kids. I have a revocable trust. It provides that if something happens to me um, and my husband, those assets are managed for my children's benefit, for their health, education, maintenance, and support. And then I picked some ages for it to turn over to them in a graduated manner. So they get a third at 25, a third at 30 and the rest at 35. My kids are really small. That's a classic example for, you know, when you have really little kids, if something happened to me, what would make sense? Um, and so everybody kind of, you know, you can 
play with what that looks like, but the idea is that you don't, you want it managed until they reach an age of greater maturity. Another reason people hold assets after they pass is if they have a special needs child or grandchild that they want to benefit. Typically special needs trusts are designed so as not to disqualify the recipient from any government assistance they're receiving. So they're structured in such a way to allow them to have their supplemental needs met while the government assistance is providing for their other needs. Um, then you could just have a spendthrift. So a, an individual who you think can't handle money um, and you don't want them to ever inherit a lump sum, you want it to be doled out to them either over a period of time or throughout their lifetime. Um, and so you may wanna hold it in trust for their benefit. We marriage is another one where we're seeing, um, where we do a lot of trust planning. So this really deals with second marriage situations where the couple has probably both sometimes children from prior marriages. And so you're gonna utilize a trust so that it can benefit um, the surviving spouse, but when the surviving spouse passes away, um, the first spouse's uh, assets go to his or her children. And so kind of you separate the assets so they don't get commingled and each spouse's respective children end up with their parents' assets. Um, there's other ways to do it, but that's a reason um, that people manage assets after they pass. Another one that people consider a lot is if they don't want their assets being subject to a division in their children's divorce. So if their children get divorced after they die, they want those assets managed for their benefit. Um, this can get complicated because in order to protect it from a divorce situation, it does have to be held in trust for the child. And that child can't have unilateral control. So you are giving up access to the child in order for protection. And there was ways to balance those, um, but it is something that can be addressed in a trust. It kind of goes to why you would do it for management purposes. If you're doing it simply for probate avoidance, or even if you're creating a trust because you want it to be managed after you die, you're only going to get the biggest bang for your buck with a trust if you also avoid probate. But simply having a trust alone is not enough to avoid probate. You actually have to fund the trust. Uh, a trust is just a piece of paper. It's only as good as those assets that are pointed towards it. So in order to use it to avoid probate, you actually have to what we call fund it. And that's just coordinating your assets with the trust. It can, avoid, it can involve an assignment of your personal belongings. Um, most trusts do this either with a schedule or a bill of sale when they're signed. It just generally assigns all of your stuff, your clothes, furniture, jewelry into your trust. Um, you typically need real estate into the trust. The trust becomes the owner of real estate. This is particularly important if you own real estate in multiple states. If you're trying to avoid probate, um, Probate in one state is one thing, but if you own real estate in multiple states and you die, each state you own real estate in, you need a separate probate proceeding. So anytime we have clients that have real estate in multiple states, we do recommend that they have a trust so that their family doesn't have to go through that. But in order to do that, you need to deed the real estate into the trust. Another question we get a lot is whether you know, your New Hampshire trust or your Massachusetts trust can hold real estate in another state. And it certainly can. So you don't need a trust in every state you own real estate. You can just put, you know, in your New Hampshire trust, you can have your Arizona property, you can have your Florida property, you can have your California property, whatever it is owned in your New Hampshire trust. You would coordinate your bank accounts and your non-retirement investment accounts with the trust, either by transferring them into the trust or making them payable to the trust. Um, business interests can be in, assigned to the trust, um, shares in corporations. Um, you can do assignments of interest in LLCs. And then one of the things you have to be careful about is how you coordinate your retirement accounts. So you always want to carefully discuss this 
when you're creating a trust about who the beneficiary of your retirement account should be. And you wanna be mindful of that. Retirement accounts come with tax consequences. And so sometimes even when you have a trust, the retirement accounts are gonna stay beneficiary to, particularly if you have adult beneficiaries, your adult beneficiaries outside of the trust. And other times your trust is gonna be written in such a way to be able to be the beneficiary of those trusts. But you do wanna be careful about that. But in order to really take advantage of your trust, you do have to coordinate your assets with the trust. Um, I'm gonna to turn to irrevocable trusts. Um, like I said, the other ones are your main planning, state planning tools. Irrevocable trusts are done for particular purposes. And really there's two main purposes that you would use to create an irrevocable trust. The first is if you want to do estate tax planning or gifting. Um, like I said, the estate tax exemption is very high, so this doesn't apply to as many people anymore, but it is still a reason that people do irrevocable trusts. The other reason is for Medicaid planning. So briefly touching on estate and gift tax planning, um, like I said, the exemption amount, $12,900,000, but people that have taxable estates or may have taxable estates may want to utilize some gifting tools to maximize the amount of assets they can leave using their estate tax exemption amount. There's also a um, annual exclusion amount of $17,000 where you can leave assets to an individual without utilizing your estate tax exemption. To the IRS, they classify this as de minimis gifts. Um, but it can be really useful to build um, over time, annual exclusion gifts and really transfer some significant wealth using that without using your estate tax exemption amount. These types of trusts that are used for estate tax planning are like an alphabet soup. We do pilots, cuperts, grats. They're all for gifting to families. We can also add charitable components to that, cruts, crats, slats, um, flats. They're all beyond the scope of this <laughs> seminar, but if people have questions about them, we do them all. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about those. I think um, more people are really interested in the Medicaid planning side of using irrevocable trusts because a big concern for people is the cost of long-term care. And so you can use irrevocable trusts for Medicaid planning. Um, Medicaid planning talks about qualifying yourself for Medicaid should you need long-term care. And the rules for Medicaid are different depending on if you are married or a single individual. So if you're a single individual, you can only have $2,500 to your name. If you're married, um, you your home is never a countable asset as long as one spouse can live there. And the spouse that's at home can keep half their assets up to approximately $130,000. That number is indexed for inflation, so it changes a little bit. But as you can see, there's a very different approach if you're married versus not married um, when you're applying for Medicaid about what assets are countable or not. Irrevocable trusts are used for this type of planning in anticipation of possibly needing to go into a nursing home because of what most people know about or most people have heard about a five-year look back. Um, and so what happens when you apply for Medicaid is your financial records for the past five years are looked at, and you can't have made a gift within five years of applying for Medicaid. So the idea with Medicaid planning is that you make a gift more than five years before you need to apply for Medicaid. And um, when we talk about a gift here, it is a gift of any amount. People often get confused about that $17,000 annual exclusion amount that I mentioned for tax planning purposes and think it applies to Medicaid planning. Oh, I can give my annual exclusion gifts and it's not gonna be a problem. That's not true. Um, it's just a tax um, rule and it doesn't apply for Medicaid. 
any gift is considered a Medicaid gift if it's a transfer of wealth. So certainly something like $10,000 that's under the $17,000 would be a disqualifying transfer. If you're gonna utilize an irrevocable trust for Medicaid planning, like I said, you do it more than five years before you have to apply for Medicaid. And oftentimes these types of trusts are income only trusts. You have to give up your right to the principal of the asset. Um, and so sometimes people keep their right to the income, but give up the right to the principal. In that instance, the principal is protected, but you can still benefit from the income from the trust. Um, oftentimes the other asset people wonder about is their home. And this is state specific. So New Hampshire has one rule um, regarding the transfer of your home into an irrevocable trust. The general rule is if you're gonna transfer your home into an irrevocable trust and continue to live there, you actually have to rent it back to yourself. This is not true in every state. So for example, just over the border in Massachusetts, the courts have said somebody can transfer their home into an irrevocable trust and continue to have the right to live there and it won't be a countable asset. So obviously um, a little easier to think about doing that in Massachusetts than maybe in New Hampshire where you're having to pay fair market value rent to do this type of planning. But a lot of this is state specific um, because while Medicaid is a federal program, each, state's, each state administers it on its own. Um, so irrevocable trusts are an option for Medicaid planning. The other thing that you can consider obviously is long-term care insurance, um, totally different type of um, planning there, but it is an option for Medicaid planning. And um, Medicaid rules are also exceedingly complicated um, and there's a lot of them. So I did want to provide you a link, ooh, sorry. Um, for um, some information about Medicaid. It is put out by the New Hampshire Bar Association and it is really helpful. Although if you go to the link, I do encourage you to print out if possible, the Medicaid pamphlet. It is designed to be printed and it's very hard to read on the computer screen um, because it jumps around page by page, but um, it's super helpful in understanding the basic rules of Medicaid. So I think that's what I have, and I'm happy to turn it over to you. Excellent, thank you. Um, I do know I said we do some questions and answers at the end here, uh, but I do want to clarify for those listening, uh, everyone is muted, so we won't be able to hear people ask questions verbally, but on the bottom of your screen, there should be the option to do Q&A or to do a chat. So if you do have any questions, uh, please put them through there. Uh, we did have one come in that Alyssa, I think would be uh, rather quick to answer. So yeah. I'll ask that before we transition. Um, and someone that just asked, Abby had asked, you mentioned anyone over 18 should have a living will. Would you say the same for a final will, specifically for a married couple in their thirties? So I wouldn't say necessarily everybody needs a will um, over the age of 18, but a married couple, probably if you want everything going to your spouse and you live in New Hampshire, it is advisable to get a will because that's not actually what the um, intestacy law provides. So, you know, 18 year old that might have a bank account and they want to leave it to their parents, that's actually what the intestacy law provides. So no, does an 18 year old need a will? Probably not. A married couple in their 30s, yeah, they might want a will. Perfect. And actually, I did have uh, one other uh, question for you know young couples here. Um, you had mentioned the will is where you could put guardianship for small children. Uh, where would you put information for how you want your pets to be, um, you know, taken care of upon your passing? So it depends on if you have a trust or not. If you have a trust, that information would go in the trust. If you don't, it can go in the will. Um, it's often um, either a distrib a lot of people do a distribution of their pets along with the gift to care for their pets, but that's typically done to the person that they're going to give the animals to. So, you know, I leave my dogs to my sister Jane, 
and I leave her $5,000 or $10,000 to care for my animals. If you want to give a gift, you do that also. And you can do that either in a will or trust. Excellent. Thank you. I have a few more questions, but I think that those would be good for the end. So uh, I'm going to, to introduce uh, Buddy here in greater detail. Um, so Buddy Fanouf is a fourth generation funeral director and is someone that uh, works at a, a family business. That's something we can only aspire to here. Um, he has worked in the funeral service for over 30 years. Prior to that, he worked for Deloitte Consulting in Washington, D.C. The Fanu family owns and operates funeral homes and, cre and crematories throughout New Hampshire and Vermont and serve 3,500 families annually. Buddy is the chairman of the Fanu Family Foundation, a nonprofit which assists indigenous families through New Hampshire and Vermont who otherwise could not afford to pay for final expenses. Buddy currently sits on the boards of Catholic Medical Center, the St. Marie Endowment Fund, and the Sunshine Initiative. Fanu Family, the Fanu Funeral Homes is the 2021 and 2022 Great Places to Work certified company and has won a number of awards for service excellence. They have served the community since 1906. So they're not kidding about being fourth generation there. Um, so, buddy, I know for your part, we had talked about, uh, I just, we receive a lot of questions from clients on some of this planning, right? Even when it comes to pre-planning for funeral expenses or just their funeral in general, uh, some questions actually uh, on Medicaid and things like that. So I'd like to just ask you a couple of those questions sure. and then I'll ask a few too, as they come into the question and answer section here. Um, but, you know, the first one is, a lot of people just wonder, you know, what is the benefit of pre-planning when it comes to for their funeral? So we ask this a lot, and there, there's really no one reason for, for everyone. Um, one of the main reasons people pre-plan is to ensure that your final wishes will be fulfilled. New Hampshire, we could talk about this. New Hampshire, believe it or not, has amongst the best consumer laws when it comes to families pre-arranging and pre-paying for their services. Um, back in, when my great grandfather and grandfather, there weren't a lot of options. Everybody went to the church, everybody had a wake, everybody went to the cemetery. Um, really, you're just questioning what church you want to go to, what day do you want to have the service. Now, fast forward to 2023, um, people are being cremated. New Hampshire, believe it or not, has one of the highest cremation rates in the country, over 80%. Um, so a lot of people plan because they want to ensure maybe their cremation wishes, um, maybe they want to have a simple veterans burial at the veteran cemetery. Maybe they wanna donate their body to science through an anatomical gift program. Um, maybe they wanna you know, have certain specific things. So um, once you pre-pan or pre-arrange your services, it is against the law for someone to change your wishes either during your lifetime or at the time of death. You can do it yourself, your power of attorney, as Alicia, Alyssa talked about how powerful that can be, can change it. Um, but at the time of death, no one can change your wishes. Uh, the second reason I think a lot of people do it is really for the financial burden part of it. A funeral does not have to be expensive. We could be talking a $1,200 cremation or a $20,000 funeral and everything in between. Um, but by doing things in advance, there are ways to lock in your price uh, of your funeral at today's prices. Funeral go goes up, um, increase. With the rate of inflation, three or four percent a year doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, over 10, 15, 20 years, that five thousand dollar funeral could be, you know, ten or twelve thousand dollars. So that's another reason why people do it. Uh, and a third reason, and it perfectly dovetails into Alyssa's talk about Medicaid, is it's um, by pre-planning, it's one of the few ways to exclude assets for Medicaid. Um, Alyssa talked about special trust. We actually create some for the families, create something called an irrevocable mortuary trust. So once the funds are in this trust, they're excluded for Medicaid eligibility, for nursing home spend down uh, situations. So we, we get lots and lots and lots of people that call and say, mom's going into nursing home and at 10 to $12,000 a month, it does not take long to go through someone's assets. Um, they can come in, we can have them move their funds into an irrevocable mortuary trust and those funds will not be used to pay for, for Medicaid, um, nursing home care, they're excluded from that. Um, and we, we try to be very, um, very thorough. So not only the normal things you would think about funeral, 
we're putting in oftentimes uh, flowers, assistance for luncheons after the fact, uh, monuments, markers, cemetery charges, clergy fee, honorariums. Um, so the, anything that is customary and reasonable that we normally put onto a funeral can be placed into one of these uh, irrevocable mortuary trusts. So those are really the three main reasons why people sort of plan ahead to get, get those things taken care of. Okay, that, that, that's helpful. And I guess one of the questions that I also get that dovetails with what you're saying is, you know, I've planned it, I've put it into one of these trusts, mm -hmm. you know, my wishes are known, and now I move. And, you know, I move, we have a lot of clients that, you know, move to Florida or move mm -hmm. to Arizona. You know, now, now what are their options? So funeral arrangements in, a lot of people don't realize this, that, but funeral arrangements are regulated by lots of different entities. One of them is the Federal Trade Commission and every state has a state regulatory board. In New Hampshire, um, prepaid funeral arrangements are required to be portable. So what that means, if you prepay a funeral here in New Hampshire with a funeral home and you move to Florida or you move across town, or the funeral home that you used to make arrangements with got sold, or maybe you know the ownership changed. You can move um, through a letter to the funeral home, you can move not only what you originally paid, this is another benefit which New Hampshire has, which many other states don't, not only what you paid has to be transferred, but any accumulated interest, because what funeral homes do is we place the funds into an irrevocable life insurance product, irrevocable, irrevocable mortuary trust, so they earn interest. Um, the funds are invested, um, usually by a, you know, a broker, and as those funds get in, that's how funeral homes lock in price. Well, if you paid a funeral home $5,000 five years ago, and you now decide you want to move to Florida, and that irrevocable trust has grown to $6,000, by law, we have to transfer not only the corpus, the original five, plus any accumulated interest at all to any funeral home. So there's a, um, other states are different. In Florida, Florida only has to, Florida funeral homes by law only have to transfer what was originally paid. We had a lady actually last week that passed away that had prearranged her cremation in Florida 25 years ago, paid $500 for a cremation in Florida. She moved to New Hampshire um, to live with her daughter, passed away, we reached out to the FINA home in Florida, they transferred us $500, what she paid 25 years ago. That's a state law in Florida, it's not the state law in New Hampshire. All right, that's very interesting. Um, do you have another question uh, for you, buddy, from the question and answer? And um, the Heinzmans are asking, are there other ways to dispose of the body besides cremation or full body funeral? There are many, actually. Um, we actually have a whole seminar about this. Um, so I'll try to take an hour seminar and cull it down to a minute or two. Uh, there are, one of, the men, one of the ways things I talked about is anatomical donation. So body donation is not the same as organ donation. Organ donation is what you put in the back of your license saying, I wanna donate my organs if I pass away. Full body donation can either be done through an anatomical gifting program through a, an accredited mortuary, I'm sorry, an accredited um, um, medical school. There are also anatomical programs, nonprofit and for-profit that take your body and they will basically use it for um, research or sell body parts for profit for other entities that are doing certain things. Anatomical gifting donations. Here in New Hampshire, we only have one, which is Dartmouth Medical School. Um, but that you don't have to just be limited to this. We actually have a contract with Dartmouth, Tufts, Harvard, UMass, and there's one more I can't think of. So those are all close anatomical gifting programs that you can gift your body to science. So fair warning, we always tell people they should have a plan B. Because just because you have signed up, and by the way, you cannot sign up, well, you, you couldn't because you'd be dead, but your family cannot sign you up for anatomical gifting after a death occurs or if you are incapacitated. So when the family called and said, mom died, she wanted to donate her body to science uh, through medical school, too late, can't do it. You have to do it during your lifetime. Um, and also, about 70% of the people who are signed up for medical schools 
get accepted. Um, in some cases, the medical schools don't need anatomical, they're full. During COVID, Dartmouth was not accepting, nor were any of the medical schools accepting any of the anatomical programs because their medical students weren't, weren't coming on site. Um, maybe you passed away in a trauma, maybe you passed away you know, across the country. So there are situations that you may not be able to be accepted from the medical program. So that's why we always tell folks have a plan B, um, maybe get some arrangements in place, maybe not pay for them, but at least have a plan B for what those are. Um, so that's one option. Uh, there are a couple um, other options. There is something called, um, um, it's basically, comp with, with, I'm trying to make this in a delicate way. It's basically uh, full body composting, which has recently been passed in New York state. It's been passed in Vermont. Um, it's in Oregon, Washington state, and maybe California. And um, it's about a six month process where your body gets uh, decomposed in a natural process to organic material. What's left is about 70 pounds of organic material. Um, that's in its infancy. That's something that's definitely um, getting a lot of traction. How realistic is it? Uh, a lot of people think it's inexpensive. It's about eight to twelve thousand dollars just for the process, so it's not certainly not an inexpensive option. Uh, and then the last option, which is not not allowed in New Hampshire, uh, it is in Maine, it is in uh, Vermont, is something called alkaline hydrolysis, which is basically they call it water cremation. It's a process where the body is reduced to to bone fragments, but instead of using heat, it's done through a chemical process. Um, some people think it is much more, uh, much more environmentally friendly because cremation um, results in um, carbon into the atmosphere. Um, we offset that because we purchase carbon offsets to make our, our cremation process carbon neutral. Um, so one of the sort of the myths of this alkaline, this get, again, anything new so it gets all kinds of traction in our industry. The alkaline hydrolysis process sounds like it's carbon neutral. The issue is that the electricity to generate the heat required through the chemicals generates because now in New Hampshire, most of the, most of the electricity is through, through coal plants which is certainly not carbon. And then the water that's left, this is probably getting into way more detail than you want, uh, the water that's left of, through the process um, has to be made inert and trucked off. So when all is said and done, it's really not a whole lot more carbon neutral than, um, than anything else. Uh, those, are, those are the top four or five alternatives that I can come up with. But again, there is a few more um, that, we do have a seminar coming in the spring that's going to talk about alternative arrangements. So um, jump on our website, sign up for our newsletter, and you'll, you'll be made notice of that. So I hope that sort of answered your question. Again, that's a, that's a one hour presentation that I did in about two minutes. So no, that's wonderful. Thank you. And that's something at the when we put this recording on our website, we'll also include links to both of your websites. Because uh, Alyssa, I know you provided a lot of materials in there as well for people to go to. And same with you, buddy. Uh, so people will be able to sign up for those webinars. Um, the Heinzman say thank you. So that did answer the question there. Uh, I have another one for you, buddy, was uh, home burials in New Hampshire. Can you bury a loved one at, you know, on, on your personal property in uh, New Hampshire? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand that question. Okay. Um, home burials in home wakes and funerals. So we have folks that wanna, um, for, for maybe it's religious, maybe it's cultural, they wanna have gatherings and services in their homes. Um, and, and that is absolutely fine. You can even transport your loved one, assuming you have the correct paperwork from the place of death, nursing home, hospital to your home to have a home wake, funeral, and oftentimes then we'll take over after the family has done that. Uh, and we have a lot of digital assets on our website. One of it actually talks about home funerals. As far as home burials, um, you're basically talking about a private cemetery um, for a casket. You can bury an urn at home or on private property, no problem, no permits, no requirements. You can create a home cemetery, a private family cemetery, with the required regulations from the state of New Hampshire. Of course, that has to be deeded into the property. Um, there's certain setback requirements, can't be needed water. And when you create a home cemetery, 
it's forever. So you can't sell your home cemetery down the road for condos. Um, so it's it's a home cemetery, a private family cemetery forever. But yeah, we actually in at one of our funeral homes in Vermont, we um, uh, we had two home home burials where the family had private family cemeteries on their property. So yep, you absolutely can do it as long as you meet the state requirements. All right, thank you, uh, Alyssa. I, I do have a question to to ask you, and yep. someone was asking Buddy about you know what happens if someone moves. It'd be the same thing if if someone set up their documents in New Hampshire, and now they move out of state. You know what document should be updated? Is it important that it's done with a attorney in that same state? Yeah, so I mean, you should have your documents done by an attorney that's licensed to practice law in the state where you live. Um, and uh, if you move, it is advisable to have your documents reviewed by an attorney in the state where you're now residing. Um, all the documents, you know, would work. Um, you know, there's reciprocity between states regarding all of these documents. So they would essentially work in the state where you're now residing. They may not be the best form. Um, so each state has their own probate rules. Um, and certain states have certain rules regarding trusts, particularly like, for example, Florida has some specific rules about actually it's real estate um, tax abatements that um, if you're going to own a trust in a non-Florida trust, um, you might need to have an amendment to your trust to kind of take advantage of those. I know that because we have a lot of Florida clients. Um, so you may want to have them reviewed by an attorney in that state. The really important ones to update typically are your financial powers of attorney and your healthcare powers of attorney. Um, financial institutions that you're dealing with in the new state and healthcare institutions are more familiar with the form of their state. And so it's going to be easier for the person utilizing those if the entity that you're dealing with has seen the form before. It's not that the other ones wouldn't work, but you know they might have to have it reviewed by an attorney there. And then you know there's questions about what they can and cannot do. And so if you just have the form they're familiar with, it's going to be easier. But certainly, you know, I get asked all the time, you know, if I have a New Hampshire advance directive and I'm in, you know, on vacation in Florida or if I'm on vacation somewhere else. Um, is it still going to work? Yes, it's still going to work. Excellent. Um, and another question about what happens in multiple states. You had mentioned some tax planning when it came to the revocable and the irrevocable trust, uh, not being as much of a concern because not everyone has over the 12.9 million per spouse. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But certain states have their own state uh, tax um, for estate plans. Is that how how do you take that into account? Like I believe Massachusetts is a million. Yeah. So I mean you do have to take that into account. So um, you know, if we have a New Hampshire client that has property in Massachusetts, um, that property can be subject to an estate tax in Massachusetts, even if the person isn't a Massachusetts resident. Um, it's a complicated formula based on the percentage of assets that are actually owned in Massachusetts, how much tax they would pay. But it may be something where, yeah, otherwise they wouldn't need tax planning. But now because you own property in a state that has an estate tax, you need to take into consideration um, planning for that property that could be taxable. And the reverse is also true. I mean, if you live in Massachusetts, um, but you own property outside of the state, um, you know, your Massachusetts property is going to be subject to that million dollar tax, but the property you own outside the state isn't going to be. So um, we have to take that into account in planning for, you know, I'm admitted to practice law in Massachusetts. So I do that for our clients there um, where we're planning for a Massachusetts estate tax exemption amount, um, but taking into consideration property that they might have outside mm -hmm. of the state. Uh so a, a follow-up question for you, Alyssa, and then actually uh, yep. I'm going to ask you something similar. But um, do any of the trusts that you're mentioning, both revocable or irrevocable, need to be on file with the state? No, they are private agreements. Um, and that is another benefit of a trust is that, um, you know, unlike a will, which does have to be filed when you pass away and is public record, a trust is not a public document. Um, so it's not filed while you're alive, and it's also not filed at death. Um, if you record real estate into the trust, you might have to do something about it, like it's called a trust certification, um, but that's not the trust itself being recorded anywhere. Um, so no, they don't have to be filed and that's actually a benefit for them. 
Yeah, and, and so, Buddy, the, the similar question for you is, is the same thing. Does the irrevocable mortuary trust uh, need to be filed with the state? It, it does not. It doesn't need to be filed, but uh, it needs to be um, accessible. So if the funeral home um, is inspected with every, we get inspected every three, three years, um, the, the regulatory board needs to ensure that the trust, because it's almost like an escrow account, it is not the funeral home's money. We get a lot of that, like, oh, what if I prearrange? Because I used to, the funeral home down the road closed and what happened, it is not our money. It has to sit in, into this special account, um, like an escrow account and what irrevocable mortuary trust. Um, so, but it is not filed, it's not public. No one can come in. Your creditors can't come in and take a look at what's on there. But the state, they don't, the state doesn't care. The regulatory board doesn't care what's in there. They just want to make sure funeral homes are following the proper regulations. There was a funeral home up north I said was, past tense, um, who thought there was an option to take the prepaid funeral arrangements and not put it into a trust, um, but use the money to go to Florida uh, and go on vacation. So he, he went to jail and his funeral home got sold. So it, it's not a slap on, you know, on the wrist. It's a pretty big deal. So, yeah. Excellent. And you guys have, have been around since uh, 1906, so we're pretty comfortable. <laughs> yeah, uh, our, our funds aren't going anywhere. So, <laughs> um, a question here for Alyssa uh, being asked: If you leave your out-of-state property to your siblings or spouse, are you still subject to those states' uh, estate tax? Um, so it all depends on the state that we're talking about. So different states have different rules regarding um, how their state estate taxes are calculated and who's, who's required to have them be paid. Um, I'm gonna say this, I, well, I think every state exempts spouses. Um, I'm not aware of any state that would require a tax to be paid if you leave your um, assets to your spouse. Um, but siblings would certainly be subject to some of these taxes, um, not all estate taxes, some estate taxes, siblings, I think are exempt. Um, New Jersey has some really funky rules. <laughs> um, I'm not admitted to practice in New Jersey, but I do know it. They have some funky rules about who is and who isn't subject to taxes. So, uh, I can't universally say all of that, but, um, you know, classic estate tax um, exemptions are, you know, not payable. You're, there's no estate tax payable if you leave assets to a spouse, but would be to anybody else. Um, so yes, it's quite possible that if you leave your assets to your sibling, they would still be subject to an estate tax. And James, I'm just going to quick, um, in terms of, of taxes, we often get people that ask, um, if I prepay my funeral, can I, is that a deduction? Can I write that off my taxes? And the answer is, I'm not a tax attorney, but I can with confidence say that you you don't are not getting a deduction for you. Or if you pay your, your mom's funeral or family members, you know, that is not a tax deduction. Excellent. It is potentially deductible on an estate tax return, though. It is so. on an estate tax return, correct? Yes. And it's, so. and it's a reimbursement through probate as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a, and it's the priority. So funeral homes get priority um, for if you have a, a state, so. Correct. Excellent. Um, just have one other general question that, that I'll uh, answer on here. Just um, Ann Perello is asking about long-term care insurance. I'd like to talk about that. So that's something that, um, you know, we can do another seminar on um, and talk about, but uh, it's essentially just, Several options out there. It, it's evolved quite a bit over the last couple of years, uh, where you can buy traditional long-term care insurance, where you you pay an annual premium and you hope it's a waste of money. But if it's not, you have access to uh, the company's checkbook to cover a certain amount of your expenses. And, and as Buddy referenced, you know, in, in New Hampshire, you're looking uh, ten, twelve thousand dollars a month for full-blown, uh, you know, nursing care, uh, nursing home care. Um, there's others that are tied to life insurance chassis where I like to say it's terrible life insurance, but uh, great long-term care insurance. But if you don't end up using it and you pass, your uh, heirs at least get essentially your premiums back in a death benefit. Um, but something, a lot of nuance in those. So those are something it'd be good to uh, talk to an insurance agent or your wealth manager about. Um, 
looks like here we do have a few other uh, some nuanced questions uh, just because of the time I think those would be good ones for uh, individuals to reach out to you two and ask uh, those questions about. Um, so like I said, it, this is all being recorded. So, you know, it's a lot of information. I really appreciate you two taking the time to, uh, to share all this. Uh, if others want, to, they can come back. If, they if you have others you think would benefit from this, you can feel free to share the link. But even if yourself trying to remember some of this a few days later, it will be available. And on that same page, we'll include uh, both contact information for you both and, and your website. So uh, anyone can access the materials that you've referenced. Um, let's see. So it looks like we have all the questions. So thank you everyone for, for attending. And we'll be putting out some more information uh, for our next webinar, which this our next one will be on cybersecurity and identity theft protection. Uh, and like uh, Buddy had referenced, they're going to have several seminars, which can we sound a little bit more interesting than ours. Um, so uh, very interesting story. So you can go to his website and uh, sign up for those as well. So thank you, everyone. And I hope you have a great night. Okay. Thank you. Bye.